wonder-working power in the precious... Incredible as they seem, are not the results of mass hysteria. <laughs> You may wish to adjust the dial. You are currently tuned into the wrong station. Once, long ago, he had heard her singing beneath the freighted orange boughs of a castle known as Heart's Desire, and as she walked beside him now, he could almost convince himself that they were home again, and that the cold fogs of Dimness Fen were only the pleasant mists that filled a palace garden by the sea. But from time to time she turned back to look at him and grin, as though she could sense these thoughts, and when she did, the leering skull showed through her unreal face, and he did not realize it was a kindness for her to remind him that she was a ghost. No moon came out that night. No stars could pierce the clouds that smothered Dimness Fen. Only the ghost, her tangerine glow, lit up the blackness of the woods they walked. Here. She said at last, This is the place. Like the rotted trunk of some massive broken tree, a small stone tower hunched, crumbling among the brown-leaved boughs. In her paltry light it seemed malignant, swollen, bloated up with darkness from within. What is this place? He asked. She shrugged. Shelter. Who built it? Why is it here? Why is it left abandoned? Her smiling teeth were square and sharp. Am I supposed to know everything now? Sometimes it seems like you do. Well, that's not because I'm a ghost, she said. It's only because I'm not as slow as you. She was gone, as usual, before he could reply. One of the privileges of death, perhaps. You always got to have the final word. Because you were the final word. The tower's door, when he reached into its pool of darkness was unlocked. He entered with a drawn sword, but no creature hurled itself at him from the gloom. The place was empty. Fumbling in the blackness of the tumbled hearth, he found a wooden box filled with dry tapers and a striking flint. A shower of sparks from the edge of his sword revealed candles on the mantelpiece, and soon a low red glow revealed the room. Somebody had been living here not too long ago, but there was no sign of them now. The bed was unmade and smelled of mildew. A large desk was strewn with broken glass and sheaves of rag paper that a leak in the ceiling had turned to grayish sludge. One small glass jar still stood upon a shelf. It wore a label reading, Do Not Drink. Too tired and hungry to care about the mystery of this place, he searched only for food and water. But even then, he found all three. A sealed larder off the main room was stocked with cured meats and hardtack bricks, with jars of herbs preserved in precious olive oil, with stacked-up firkins full of watered wine. And as he entered this room, mouth agape at the wasted plenty, a little sound disturbed the silence of the night behind him. He whirled, blade and candle high, and found himself facing in the red light. A small, speckled pig. For a moment, each stared at the other in surprise. And then the pig screeled in terror, unfolding little wings and taking to the air in a cloud of frantic motion. A moment later it was gone through the open window, and Theo was gawking at the sill, unable to tell in the outer darkness if the thing he'd thought he'd seen was what he'd truly seen. Then, not knowing what else to do, 
he shut the door and drew the blinds. In the red darkness, he ate and drank until almost sick, and then tumbled into the rank sheets. Sleep came instantly. It was a long time since he'd had any bedding but snarled roots in the cold, bare ground. Sometime in the middle of the night, though, his bliss and oblivion was shattered by the sound of screaming in the woods. Easy, said the ghost. She was standing over the foot of his bed, as she often was when he awoke, looking down at him with empty sockets and an unreadable face. The danger's far away. Sound carries in the woods at night. How can I be sure? I'll wake you up if any danger comes. And if I don't, he will. Her gesture lit the gloom, revealing something warm that nestled in the bedding at his feet. It was the little winged pig, wheezing softly as it slept. It took a while for the screams to end outside, but when they did, Theo drifted softly off to sleep again, lulled by the gentle breathing of the creature at his feet. He didn't even wake when the second round of screams began. Dawn came, gray and unchanged, always unchanging here on the gray fens, with the slow wrench of seasons signified only by the presence of frost or algal slime along the edges of the slate gray water. Theo rose early, risked a fire, made himself a porridge of hardtack braised in sausage meat and wine. As he cooked, the pig made a nuisance of itself, pacing back and forth in front of the ruined workbench, screeching in complaint and beating its tiny, feeble wings. Even when Theo put down a bowl of gruel for it to eat, the pig continued to pace and screech. He looked at it. It looked back at him, beseeching with its bright black eyes. What is it you want? A screech, and another, turning its gaze to look up at the shelves above the workbench. Theo stood and reached for them. The screech softened into an affirming snort. He pulled away. The screech resumed. Is this what you want? He had put his hands in the glass jar, the one whose label cautioned, Do not drink. Screech, screech. He considered the jar. Are you sure? It's got a warning. Screech, a decisive stomp of the right front trotter. He thought about it for a moment. Eventually, he shrugged. You're a free pig. He unstopped the jar and set it down. No sooner had the jar touched the floor than the pig charged forward, knocking it over to slurp greedily at the spilled water. Theo leaped back in surprise at the sudden movement, and as he watched, the pig threw back its head and shrieked. Not the screech complaint from a moment before, but a high, clear sound of pain. The skin along the creature's back began to ripple, like water on the surface of a beaten drum. And then it split, bubbling and liquefying as the bones and innards rose into the air, as if lifted by a huge invisible set of hands which squashed, mashed, stretched, and remolded them. And all this while the pig's shriek hung upon the air, even when the mouth and skin were swallowed up into the whirling orb of viscera and splintered bone. In horror, Theo fell back against the wall as the squeal's pitch dropped into a squawk, and the flesh lengthened and smoothed itself in the air, goose pimpling a pale new skin, and then darkened, softening in texture until a long, blue feathered neck unrolled, crowned at the head with golden brows and amber beak, and behind them the wings unfurling wide like vast, dark waves. The speckled pig had been remade. Where it had stood, a long, great heron skipped, ungainly on its gangling legs, crowing as it raised its crested helm toward the broken window. A moment later it was in the air, and shouldering aside the tattered blinds to fall upon the pallid skies of morning. And then it was gone, silent in the wind save for the slow and heavy pulsing of its mighty wings. And for the second time in a dozen hours, Theo was left 
dumbfounded, staring at the open window. Later, by luck or providence, he found his way back to the shore where he had seen the lathe worm's trail the night before. No rain for now. The day was chill and gray and still. The fog had also thinned, enough that he could make out the phantom of a farther shore, glowering with willows and hemlocks. He suspected the worm's lair lay somewhere on that coast. But could it be reached by land? He had no desire to swim across the cold unknown between them. Perhaps if he followed his own shore, it would bring him around. Off to the left, it seemed to curve in that direction, before becoming lost in silver mist. And so, having nothing else to go on, he trusted intuition and began to wade along the banks of red bramble and dry gold reed grass. Each step was an effort on this thicketed margin, and an hour's toil brought him only a mile's gain. His threadbare clothes could not protect him from the pricking thorns. His ragged boots could not keep out the icy mud. But Theo was used to these hardships and welcomed their distraction, for they kept his mind on the moment at hand instead of straying down the haunted tracks of memory. It was around mid-morning that he found the knight in rusted mail who had spoken in the hall at Fencaster the day before. Somebody had tied him to a tree and cut his throat down to the spine. There were other injuries as well that marked his death as no mere execution, but a murder done for sport. Maybe his had been the screams that wakened Theo in the night. Or maybe Shaythaban had left more victims in the forest. He stood for a long moment, wondering what to do. The pragmatist in him, the survivor, knew there was nothing to be done, for the dead were dead. But another part of him, the part he'd thought had drowned along with all he loved, cried out for recognition of another human life, for ritual and dignity in the face of wild emptiness. And so he cut the body loose and brought it, armor and all, to the water's edge. He tried to think of something to say, but his childhood had been unchurched, and once more he found he had no words worthy of the things he felt. I'm sorry, he said. Whoever you are, if I had a shovel I would make a grave. If I had dry wood I'd build a pyre. Water would be my last resort. He trailed off. Wind in the hemlocks, distant crows. A rogue bloom of sunlight flowered the clouds, then withered up. At least it won't take long this way. You'll become part of the fens. By summertime, you'll be a water lily on the flood. With no more words presenting themselves, he heaved the body off into the black waters where its weight of rusted chain dragged it quickly underneath. It all felt so unceremonious. Scarcely a ripple showed across the surface. Within a moment, all traces of the night were gone, and if anyone beyond these woods awaited his return, then they would wait until the end of days. He will not be a water lily, said the ghost. She was bending over the water on his left contemplating the opacity of depth. Daylight had turned her beautiful once again, but vindictive. He'll sink below the mud, entombed, encased, preserved, and mummified forever in a reeking hell of cold and slimy things. Her cruelties wearied him. Please, he said, be gone. She sneered. I am, she said. And then she was. His pace quickened as he found a game trail that led along the water's edge, and then through the gnarled woods that overlooked the fens from shaggy bluffs. The bright gray skies had darkened once again with rain, but these strange woods seemed bright, seemed vivid with the emerald richnesses of fern and moss that swathed its barren oaks. The trail was meandering deeper into the woods, away from where he meant to go, and he was about to turn back when a thud of wingbeats sounded overhead. 
A great bird winged low among the branches. A heron. The same one as before. It seemed too little like a coincidence. And so he followed its course, winding down deeper into a cathedral grove of silent, wide-spaced pines. The fog grew thick, and soon his only guide through the white void was the sound of running water up ahead. And then suddenly his foot rang against, not soft loam, but hard, polished stone. As he knelt, it was as though he'd stepped onto a plain of solid fog, but when he pressed a palm down onto the surface he felt the cool touch of marble, white as doves, but softly feathered through with veins of pigeon grey. Welcome. The voice spoke from the belly of the mists ahead, from close to the sound of running water. It was not a human voice. Its vibrations buzzed along his brainstem. Who's there? There were steady footsteps now, and a jingling of armor. A dark silhouette suggested itself against the silver haze. Rejoice, stranger. You have come upon the font of transformation. I am its guardian spirit. The friendliness of the voice filled him with unease. It was the friendliness of an abattoir attendant that needs no fussing from the calf. He let his hand drift to the weapon at his hip. And what is the font of transformation? I am afraid that is not for you to know. The figure loomed larger, darker in the fog. Suffice it to say... This fountain is not for your use, and those whose it is have tasked me as its defender. Then I will go and leave you to your task. A warm chuckle bubbled from the speaker's throat. <laughs> I'm afraid it does not work that way. Wittingly or no, you have entered the fountain square, and it is for me to see that you do not leave, to tell another where it be. I promise you can count on my silence, said Theo. I have nobody to tell your secret. My only friends are dead. The spirit of the fountain chuckled once again. I am glad to hear you say it, and I believe you well. I know the ring of truth when it is hurt. But, all the same, I cannot let you go. All this time Theo had been backing up, but somehow had not reached the trees. Now his calf brushed against a marble edge, and he felt a mist of droplets pricking at his back. Suddenly the sound of running water was not before him, but behind, and as he glanced over his shoulder he flinched, for somehow the fountain had come up at his heels, towering, marmoreal, and white and beautiful and strange. The water which flowed so gently from its height was faintly, freshly, turquoise blue. And now, with a final footstep, the shadow in the fog stepped into sight. In form, he was like a great, round-shouldered man, with a winged bronze helmet and scaled corslet of an age gone distant by. Helm and shield and sword and corslet all alike had been rusted to the blue-green pall of verdigris. But the giant's face had been rusted too. Only his eyes and lips and hands were any other color and these were bloody scarlet red. You must kill me if you are to leave, the spirit said. Few have ever managed it before, and in the end they wished they had not won that fight. And so perhaps the simplest thing is just to die. I promise I take no pleasure from another's pain. I offer you swift and mostly painless death. Theo drew his sword and in the dim softness its edge was hard and bright. Alone of all his possessions, it was well cared for. I'm afraid I must politely refuse. The spirit threw back its head and laughed. Yes, ha <laughs> ha, yes, of course you do. Before I kill you, friend, I'd have you know, I consider you an estimable man, one after my very own heart. And before the sentence had even passed his bloody lips, the sword had leaped from his sheath and clanged in a crimson hand against the marble where Theo had been standing only a heartbeat earlier, 
Splinters of white stone hissed through the air like sleet, and Theo felt to their freezing bite as he snarled and brought his bright sword down. But the spirit's shield was broad, and caught the blow, and flung him back, with the spirit driving after, after, canny and relentless at his art. Already the repeated blows and great strength of his sword arm were tiring Theo's defense. It was only long-practiced footwork, the long stretch of his scarecrow legs and backward, slithering movements that brought the stranger briefly out of peril. Now they faced one another with the flat marble floor between them, and the fountain in behind, their figures asymmetric against the cold composition of the fountain square. Theo was breathing hard. He felt sweat pricking at his spine and armpits, and small, cold rivulets of blood along his arms. But his teeth were bared in a feral smile. He felt good. He felt alive. He had spent so long thinking, knowing that the world would be better if he died, that the act of fighting for his life felt... transgressive. Exhilarating. Blessed. Ha <laughs> ha! Cleverly played, my friend. Cleverly played. I enjoy our match. Enjoy it all the more to see that you enjoy it too. I shall savor what remains, and feel great remorse to plunge my weapon through your neck. Once more he was moving before his sentence ended, and the clean, decisive blows which flowed from his arm drove Theo back again. But this time the stranger gave ground on purpose, spiraling inwards around the square until the spirit smote him, so the spirit thought, over the fountain's lip and into the calf-deep waters of the pool. You fight less well now, friend. I deem you are growing tired. You may wish, my son, to bow your head on the marble floor, lest a harsher death should stain these waters with your blood. <sighs> I admit, I don't have many reasons to live, Theo said, feeling the gameness come upon him. But I decide when it's time for me to die. This time, he was the one to attack. Recklessly, overhanded, smashing at the spirit's unshielded left side with all the strength in his long arms. The spirit laughed for joy at this show of Elan. But as Theo tired, it was the work of a moment for the spirit to knock his sword aside and send it skittering across the marble flags. This, however, was the trap. For long ago, at a castle by the sea... Theo had learned his trade among the slime-wreathed rocks and tidal pools. The slick shallows where bad footing is as deadly as a knife. And as he lost his sword, he snaked his heel between the giant's legs and broke his stance. One shove and both combatants fell amidst the fountain's freezing current. But Theo fell on top. For a few heartbeats... The only sounds were running water and Theo's rasping breaths as he struggled to keep the giant's neck and sword arm pinned beneath the crystal surface. Then there was a sound like an explosion. With monstrous effort, the giant surged up out of the water, roaring to hurl Theo out across the marble floor, where he landed hard and rolled and sprawled like a broken bag of rice. A coward's trick! Cold water spewed clear from the spirit's scarlet lips. He staggered over the fountain's rim, lurching for Theo with crimson hands. I would have made it easy for you, friend, but you have made the harder choice. But then, as Theo tried to drag himself away in futile horror, the giant froze. No, he whispered. No. And then, no further words, as the skin along his sanguine palms began to ripple like water on the surface of a beaten drum. A roar of agony peeled itself from his brazen throat as unseen hands undid him, hoisting skin and innards into the air, crunching bone and armor all the same. His howl lasted a long time and Theo could feel every bone that cracked, split, stretched, and shrank in his enemy's body, every quart of blood that boiled away to mist and dust. He looked away, sickened to see the spirit ruined by the very magics he had sworn to guard. At last, the howling stopped, and the spirit was gone. 
What remained, as Theo slowly picked himself up, struggling for breath, was a small and gray-green salamander writhing on the fountain's edge. It had red eyes. And as he watched, a buffeting of wings descended on the square, a great gray heron, yellow-crowned alit upon the fountain's edge. Its beak, a yellow spear, shot out and pierced the wriggling thing upon the stone. A moment later, its pounding wings were once again upon the air, and erstwhile guardian and erstwhile pig were both occluded by the sulking sky. Battered and stunned, Theo limped to the fountain's edge, where he sat for a while, gazing at its cool, cyan perfection, its silvery sheen. Do not drink, he murmured to himself at last. He turned and sank so that his legs were spread out across the marble floor, the back of his head and neck resting against the fountain's cool stone. Was it luck that it spared his life? Was he lucky to survive when those he'd loved had died, to bear the weight of all those vanished lives alone? Or was it the opposite of luck? The sound of running water reminded him of that first gray, freezing morning after, when he had awoken on the rock-strewn fields of mud where the draining flood tide dropped him. But the waters of the fountain did not recede. They merely cycled endlessly through the spouts, falling and falling and falling forever and again, a bitter metaphor for life itself. And yet, as he turned to look once more, he found the fountain lovely. All was a matter of scale, for water could flow in jeweled rivulets down lanes of subtle carbon marble, or in a black wave over tilled fields and vine-wound walls. It was all beauty and horror. In the fountain pool, he saw the great black depth that sounded over Castle Heart's desire. He saw his face reflected, skull-like on the lovely flow, and saw the cockle-crusted hands of those who died, reaching to give him comfort. He plunged both hands into the water and raised them, brimming before his face. The water seemed so cool and sweet. He thirsted after its refreshment. Why don't you drink? He glanced up and saw the ghost enthroned on a marble ledge below the fountainhead. Despite the torrents tumbling through her, her coral-colored dress was dry. Why not change yourself into something else? Forget it all and live your days in blissful ignorance. Why don't you drink? He couldn't read the expression on her face, for she was wearing her aspect of the skull, and he couldn't tell from her voice whether she was asking out of cruelty or pity. Maybe it was both, just as both wonder and despair had made him plunge his hands into the water. He stared at the pooled crystal in his hands. Why don't you drink? Opening his fingers up, he let the water fall, its crystal beads cascading down like tears or comet shards. He stood away from the marble rim and wiped his palms. A bright clarity suddenly filled him. A mystery solved itself in his mind and in some small way, the world made sense. I won't drink this time, he said. But I understand now why someone would. Why someone did. This special series, The Hunting of the Lathe Worm, was written by Alexander Saxton and is performed by Anthony Botello. The Wrong Station is made possible with the generous support of our listeners on Patreon. You can also support us by leaving a rating and review on iTunes, or wherever it is you listen to The Wrong Station. The Wrong Station is co-produced by Alexander Saxton, Anthony Botello, and Jacob Duarte Spiel, 
with music composed and performed on the piano by Elan Citrin, and arranged for the viola and performed by Viola Schmidt. You can follow The Wrong Station on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and email us at therongstation at gmail.com. And until next time, thank you for listening.